welcome to the Backstage Creative, the podcast that focuses on the people who work behind the scenes of theater. My name is Krista Copper, and I created this podcast just over a year ago because I love theater. I'm a musician, and I have discovered that I love having conversations with people who work behind the scenes of theater. I found that it helped me do my job better, and it helped me stay inspired and stay um motivated to continue in this profession. And so I hope that this podcast can serve a similar role in your life. I greatly enjoy podcasts. I listen to a lot of different ones that feed and inform different interests that I have. And so um, whatever you're doing while you're listening to while you're listening to this podcast, I hope that it can serve as motivation for you and, and leave you um, inspired and, and excited that you get to be involved in the arts. Today is my conversation with Michelle Engelman. Michelle is a stage manager. I'm so grateful that she sat down and talked with me. I had a, uh, I really enjoyed this conversation, and I hope that you will too. So here we go. Here's my conversation with Michelle Engelman. Awesome. So let's start with your background, where you grew up, how you got into theater, and where you are now. Great. So uh, I grew up in the Louisville, Kentucky area. I got into theater during college uh, as an extra credit project for a theater appreciation class, but I started my love of arts as a child dancer. I went to school. I took a bunch of tour jobs and traveling jobs anywhere that would have me. I've been in Philadelphia as a equity stage management candidate employee, and I did a bunch of summer gigs, New Hampshire, North Carolina. I took some little small gigs throughout seasons, and now I am a full-time production and stage manager for Opera Orlando. Awesome. Uh, What theater did you work at in New Hampshire? I worked for Lakes Region Summer Theater. Yeah. And then what are some of the tours that you did? Um, I worked for Chamber Theater Productions out of Boston. It's a TYA-based contract that does uh, storytelling for young audiences across the country. Oh, fun. And then I did a new playwright uh, with Vermont Stage. They have a uh, young playwrights festival that tours around the state of Vermont, and I did that. Uh huh. And so all of the, the things that you listed that you were stage manager for? Yeah, I've either been stage manager or assistant stage manager. Oh, okay, nice. What are some of the challenges of a stage manager that are unique uh, to touring? Definitely having to take on more of the company management role than you might necessarily think you're going to, Mm. because even though there's like a production office and there's a company manager stationed somewhere that's helping to manage it on like the home front and you're the frontline person. So you might have to take on helping someone get to a doctor or figuring out like what's happened with payroll at this location. There's a lot of front end things that you kind of have to dial back to the office and or email. I mean, when I was on tour, we were like calling from like hotel phones and theater office phones. So, (laughs) and we were like still printing map quest directions and driving around with atlases. I mean, it feels like (laughs) a lifetime ago, but those skills like definitely come in handy now. Uh Uh-huh. I'm I'm sure. (laughs) I love it. Um, There's so many different directions we can go. What drew you to stage managing in the first place, do you think? I definitely, for me, I mean, I sort of fell into being like a a deck person ASM on in college and I just like fell in love with it. I loved the like multitasking and the figuring out the problems even before they happen and making sure you kind of have like a direction to head in so that when you only have four minutes to solve a 20 minute problem, how can you get there? How can you make the show still go on? I just like instantly fell in love with it. Yeah, that's a very, he's a very specific person, I feel like, to be a stage manager, you know, like just how um, your brain needs to work in order to prioritize problems and um, deal with all the personalities that you have to deal with and be calm and make sure everything's um, on time. <laughs> There's just, you have to multitask like crazy all the time. Yeah. I mean, it, if you're not focusing on four things at once, you're probably not on a show contract. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, so what shows are you working at now at Opera Orlando? Uh, we are in the middle of our holiday tour for Amal and the Night Visitors. We've done mm. our uh, local dress rehearsal of it. And then we had our first tour stop last weekend. And we have our second tour stop on Sunday of this Thanksgiving weekend. So I'm at home in Pittsburgh enjoying a little Thanksgiving with my family. But then I'll be back for Saturday loading the truck and Sunday doing our next show. And then we're in prep for all is calm, which is our second main stage of the season, which is the Florida um, and Southeastern regional premiere of uh, one of the new contemporary operas. Um, that's kind of out in the country now about the world war one armistice and the gentleman who like sang Christmas carols to each other and decided to just like take a night off from war. And it's all based on of, of letters and stories from the gentleman that lived it. Oh, cool. Uh, I love those projects that you get to work on that um, are not only like a good story, but also have a little have depth to them. You know, it's not just like the cutesy little love story. (laughs) Exactly. It's not just like the big four things in opera, love, marriage, death, betrayal. I mean, that's all (laughs) opera's about. So that's so true. (laughs) Um, Do you have any favorite uh, operas? What are some of your favorite shows? Well, um, I tend to really lean into uh, newer contemporary storytelling and contemporary opera. So I love a lot of quirky operas that not everyone is into. But like, uh, I really, really love Therese Rican opera by Tobias Picker. Um, It's a really interesting contemporary piece. Um, As far as classic operas go, I tend to like any classic opera that a company is doing a new interesting te- take on. So I like a mm. lot of the Baroque operas like Alcina, which all the, with all the interesting magic and you can kind of do some new interesting spins on it. Um, I did a brand new piece called The Winter's Tale with Quantum Theater in Pittsburgh. And that was all Baroque music set to Shakespeare text. So I'm definitely on the <laughs> sort of left side of opera versus like, oh, I'd love to do another Madam Butterfly for me, like doing <laughs> like the same six operas over and over again, or just not the direction I want my career to go in. Mm-hmm. So is that kind of the focus of opera Orlando is contemporary stuff or not, they don't necessarily do co- a ton of contemporary, but their focus is to do new and interesting either classic pieces or like we're doing a site-specific girl of the golden west in a saloon in downtown orlando like one of the oldest bars in orlando is about to be torn down going into the summer or next year and because we were actually going to do it further out and they were like well it's getting torn down there's going to be big (laughs) changes and we were like oh well i guess we're going to do it now Mm-hmm. So we're doing this really cool site specific piece of, you know, La, La Fanchula, which is Girl of the Golden West. So, yeah, I love opera a lot. I'm a bass player. So I've, I've done quite a few operas and I, they're just so, um, especially like those older ones, like they're just so ridiculous. Like they're just so, <laughs> it's just so like one conversation would save, you know, three hours and like five people dying. You know? yeah. yeah. There's, it's always high drama over the top hijinks always. Mm-hmm. I love it. <laughs> um, so if you uh, live in Pittsburgh and are working in Florida and doing a bunch of tours, how do you take care of yourself physically and mentally? What are some of the practices that you do to make sure that you're, you stay healthy? I am like a big advocate of sort of like homeopathic, making sure you're doing like vitamin C and zinc and elderberry and that kind of stuff on a regular basis. Cause you're gonna work extra hours. You're going to touch all the props. You're going to talk to all the people. And, you know, by the time you realize you're sick, it's too late and you can't be sick. So preventative is definitely the way to go for being healthy on that side of things. And then I like to go to yoga. I don't always get into the studio, but I might do like five or 10 minutes at home in the morning just to kind of like get your brain quiet and settled and get your body awake for the day. And so those are my two kind of go-to things. Mm Mm-hmm. And then keeping a home base, like, I mean, you're not always at your house, but like knowing that you have a place that's your home with your person or your animal or whatever the things are that keep you happy, like knowing that you have that to come back to and that it's like a grounding place is also really beneficial. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've I've done the thing where you, you know, go to one theater for two months and then you're at a different theater for 
three months and you just kind of float around in your car and don't really have a home base. It's hard, like mentally not to have your own space. And yeah. Yeah. Gig life is definitely exhausting and everybody who's doing it has to find their own way of how they can like make it worthwhile for like your longevity as a human on the planet. Mm -hmm. It's so easy. I think in the theater world, because if you're, you know, if you're in theater, if you're in arts um, and you're doing it professionally, you're obviously very passionate about it because it can be a really difficult life. And so sometimes it's easy to let that, let that passion uh, take over like self care and just kind of common sense, um, getting a good night's rest and drinking water. And, um, right. but then you have to remember, like, if, if you want to do this for, you know, decades and years, then you have to get habits into your life that help you sustain a career for the long haul. Definitely. And then the other thing too, is I always just kind of think to myself is like, don't be so hard on yourself. It's, it's crazy to like talk yourself out of buying a pair of shoes or some like 15th version of a black dress. If you really love it and it's making you happy and like, you know, justifying that versus something else for like the next two weeks paycheck or whatever. I mean, sometimes you just got to do the thing that feels frivolous. That's going to make you happy because, you know, we're all working a lot of hours. We're all doing a lot of crazy things. We're all like, you know, working on the project and trying to get a certain place and working out of town. And, you know, sometimes you just got to do the thing that's going to make you feel like a better person. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, are there any, uh, misconceptions about, um, a stage manager either from, you know, when you're, um, chatting with friends who are in the theater world and you say you're a stage manager or like misconceptions within the theater community that you come up with a lot? I mean, I hear a lot of people saying that the stage manager is like the mom of the show and I don't, I don't lean that direction. Mm -hmm. I don't manage in that style and I don't feel like we're sort of the mom, I mean, so for me, that's like one of the big misconceptions out there. Like, I definitely think we're more of like, you know, the cognitive spoke that's keeping everyone together. And so I guess maybe that is sometimes the mom to some people, but like, you know, using that word and that sort of, you know, connotation has a lot of different feelings to a lot of people. And, you know, Mm -hmm. if you're coming from a family that didn't have that kind of a mom, or if you, you know, like, or if you think that means that you're like the emotional blanket for everyone to like lean into and tell you the (laughs) stories and cry on your shoulder. Like there's a ton of us that don't have time for that or are not that style of person. So I think, you know, that that's such a weird way of saying what our job is. Mm-hmm. I mean, and out, out in the real world that, I mean, the thing I tell my everyone that what I do is I say, have you seen a show? Was it magical? Did it feel seamless? Did you love it? The easiest thing to think is, is that I did that. If you didn't see anything go wrong and it felt like everything was perfect, that's what the stage manager did. We created the magic for you on the day and the time you were there. That's a great way to explain it. Uh, yeah. One of my favorite stage managers, I would never, um, call, call them a mom. Like when they walked in the room, like everyone kind of sat up a little straighter, you know, cause they, she was just like, so like on top of things and like, um, where should you be right now? You know, what are you like? Right. Um, um, and she was fantastic. She was so good. Yeah. I definitely think that, you know, the best, the best people out there that I've worked with above and sort of laterally, and even, you know, some of my younger stage management mentees that are out in the world now, I mean, I always say like, we should be inspiring the best out of our people without having to ask for it. They should Mm want to be the best on our projects because we're putting our best out there and we're bringing them along so that we're all getting to the end goal of a perfect, great performance, whatever that day's perfection is together as a team. Mm -hmm. Leading by example. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Speaking about leadership, stage managers are are obviously in a a place of like great leadership, but it's also kind of a, from my perspective, an interesting place of leadership because you're, you're kind of like an underground leader almost. (laughs) Um, So how do you, how do you grow in a leadership capacity? I mean, I think for, for me specifically, I grew in a leadership style and capacity through doing the work because every show you're on is a learning experience, whether you're the top of the food chain in the stage management world, or whether you're like the second PA on a show, 
being present and being in the room and watching how everyone works together and how their style informs how the work gets done and how it informs how the team gets the work done is a constant learning curve and constant learning experience. And, you know, that, so it's just like being aware and being a part of the process. You will learn while you're there. Have you ever failed in your career and how did you handle that? I don't know that I could per se exactly say that I have failed. There have been difficult situations that at the end I felt like, wow, this theater and I are never going to cross paths again because Mm. of how, you know, this process went down or because of, you know, the things that were uncontrollable, but you're the person that has been hired to control the uncontrollable. So in the end, it feels like a failure. And uh, I think you have to, as a stage manager in general, compartmentalize. So you have to definitely compartmentalize how you're feeling and just say like, you're doing your best in this situation. And if you need to ask for help, ask for the help. If you've asked for help and it's not getting you to where you need to go, then have another conversation about it. You know, like, uh, and there's so many things that ride on the stage manager and the show looking like a success that it's a constant, like, pressure cooker juggling scenario. Like, this thing didn't get handled and this wasn't done on time and this didn't happen. And now these other three things are behind because of those four things. And then now what are we going to do? And we just called places and the stage hand went to the wagon to stand behind it, to move it for when the scrim goes out. And as soon as they release the brake, a wheel fell off. I mean, (laughs) there's always some kind of like snowballing scenario that you end up in and you're like, okay, how do we succeed at this current exact moment? Hmm. And for, you know, in its experience, I mean, in the early days, the things that went wrong that you couldn't fix, you felt like that was the end of everything. And now you look back on that and you're like, oh, that sounds like a dream show to be on because, you know, it was this smaller thing that happened and we fixed it and it was fine. So, I mean, it's just, it's knowing that you're doing your best for the project and then putting the emotions of it aside. And if you want to go home and process it, if you want to go out in the alley on break and yell about it, chain smoke a cigarette, like whatever your (laughs) vice is. And I definitely used to be a smoker. So I know the like, oh my God, if we could just please get to break so I could go and have that cigarette. Oh, it'd be so great. You know, but those days are over. Um, (laughs) But you know, whatever your vice is, you know, taking that 30 seconds of like going to the booth and closing the door with no one in there and like taking five deep breaths and then going back out into the trenches and getting the job done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Finding, finding ways to self-regulate yourself. So you don't just like spiral out of control. Right. Because if you're the person that's supposed to be in control and you're the person that's supposed to keep the ship righted and calm and moving, you can't be freaking out. You can be freaking out on the inside, but you cannot be freaking out on the outside. Mm -hmm. How do you um, like de-stress after um, either tech week or a really stressful show or stressful rehearsal? Um, What are things that you do outside of the theater to help you like wind down for the day or um, kind of just calm down if you're really amped up? I mean, for me, uh, it's honestly like sort of just putting a pin in it, like wrapping up the day's work, sending the notes out, doing the stuff. And then once I'm in my car and I'm leaving the theater or leaving the rehearsal space, the day's over. I put on tunes. I jam Mm -hmm. out. I call a friend who's in theater and go, you would not believe what happened. (laughs) I call I call my partner and say, well, this was a day. And no, I don't want to go into it, but it's been nuts and it's awesome to hear your voice. So let's talk for two minutes before you have to go to bed and I have to go home and, you know, try to go to bed. I mean, and also like mindless TV at the end of a day, like to come home Mm. and watch like crazy housewives on Bravo, like flip out about nothing (laughs) is like a really hilarious perspective of like, okay, like, these people are literally creating drama about nothing and it's so good to watch. And meanwhile, we were in the middle of real drama, like 
and we made it. So, you know, it's fine. Everything is fine. Yeah. A lot of times like time can really put things in perspective. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I'm a, I'm a big advocate of once you've gone to bed, unless there needs to be a meeting about it the next day or in the future, or if there are notes to respond to that happened like in the morning, whatever happened yesterday happened yesterday. And, and we need to like have learned from it, but we don't need to keep picking that scab from yesterday because it's never going to, you're never going to move on if you're just continually thinking about it. Mm hmm. So you just got to kind of like learn what you've learned and move forward because the more you're looking in reverse, the more the show is not getting done, the more future projects you're not working on because you're always looking at what has happened. Yeah. Yeah. The show has to open. So <laughs> if you don't move on from things, um, yeah, the, I, I was talking to interviewing someone else a while ago and they were saying, you know, having that deadline of opening night has a really a really great way of solving problems because you like, you have to get things done. And so if you, if there's a problem, you need to solve it quick or just move away from it because you have to get to opening night. Right. Yeah. You either have to solve it or you have to table it or you have to go, this is today's solution. And tomorrow we might have a new idea, but we've got to just keep moving forward because mm -hmm. the show opens, the tickets are sold, the audience comes like those things will always happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, how do you stay organized? I have a lot of email accounts, which is crazy, but um, like I have like my freelancers professional email account, which I use at a lot of jobs. And then I, at Oprah Orlando, I have an email account with them and I have to-do lists on my computer and um, I keep notepad on my phone of like ongoing, like, okay, we were in this meeting or I just thought of this thing and I'm going to write it down. And then I spend five to 10 minutes every morning looking at all of those things. So I look at my to-do list in the morning over coffee. I check my emails and see like if there's outstanding things, you know, what it, what's still on my plate from yesterday, what's on the long-term to-do list. Like by the end of the week, we need to have this done by the end of the month, this needs to be done. Uh, you know, so I kind of just sit and like, look at over that stuff and plan my day from that on how the day is going to be. And then of course you also have like your rehearsal schedule on top of that. So what has to be done for rehearsal today? What has to be done for three days from now, like, are there props we need to ask about? So it's really just kind of having like a short term and a long term list. And then I look at it every day. Do you ever get overwhelmed by all the lists and emails? I personally don't. I mean, I kind of think that I'm one of those people that thrives a little bit on knowing that like, my to do list is almost never empty. Like it's great to get it down to one or two items because then in my mind it's like a high five to yourself and then adding more things onto the list. Hmm. So I don't think necessarily everyone feels that way about it. I know there's a lot of people that think like the constant 24 hour technology of being able to text and email and phone call someone and ask a bunch of questions and then see them in person and then ask another type of question related to what you just talked about on email feels overwhelming. But for some reason, you know, my brain is like, this is great. <laughs> I'll never be bored. <laughs> right. I'll never be bored. I mean, it does kind of, I will say it makes like my personal life communication a lot more succinct and a lot smaller. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, the days of having like four hour phone conversations with friends and family and constantly texting and emailing people, like, because I spend so much of my professional day doing it at the end of the day, the last thing I want to do is like respond to 12 personal text messages. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I mean, I will respond to them, but I just pick and choose kind of like how long of a message it is, or, you know, maybe it'll be like a, Hey, got your message. Sounds great. I'm in the middle of crazy or something like that. So it's like, I'm not ignoring you, but I'm also don't have like an hour to like text back and forth about whatever we're doing in two months or this funny thing we saw online or whatever. <laughs> mm -hmm. I will say like emojis and memes have definitely like helped that side of things. Cause you, now you at least can like you know, react in a way that's like, 
fun and participatory into your in your relationships but without having to like type a really long thing and like have a joke and whatever you can like send a meme and it kind of says all the things you wanted to say (laughs) that's a great way to look at it (laughs) are there difference are there um uh, big differences between stage managing for opera versus um like just a straight play versus a musical um, I def there definitely are differences. I mean, majority of the things that are going to be different are the prep that you have leading up to the show and the amount of paperwork that you create. Opera in general creates a lot of paperwork because the genre is based off of doing a rental production from someone else or creating your own giant spectacle you know, show that could possibly be rented or a portion of it will be rented. So you have tons of paperwork. You have this thing called the who, what, where, which is basically like the detail of every single character's track throughout the show. When they enter, what time during the show is that? What are they wearing? Do they have a prop? What happens to them while they're on stage? When are they exiting? How long are they gone? And I mean, like the the current we just did marriage of figaro for our season opener and our who what where for marriage of figaro was 20 pages whoa <laughs> and we had uh we had a smaller chorus than typically in the show and we took a fair amount of cuts during the show i mean i've done a rental show uh that came from san diego opera which is one of the big opera companies that's known for having a lot of paperwork and you know kind of had a huge amount of rental operas from the 80s and 90s and i mean they send you like probably a storage tote of paperwork alone that has like photos (laughs) and you know giant charts that you can unfold out and track everyone through the show and so that is very huge in opera and then for musicals it's kind of the bridge between opera and straight plays and paperwork, because you are going to have a certain amount of paperwork that's similar. Your quick change plots, who enters where, what their first entrance is, what kind of hair and makeup they need to be ready for at that first entrance, because it's like the gap between. And then on plays, it's a lot smaller. I mean, it they everybody is going to have some sort of a tracking paperwork, a preset paperwork for props and scenery, um, you're going to have quick change plot information so that you know who's changing costumes where and how long they have. But, you know, the scale of the show and then the more drama and things you add on to it and the bigger the budget is, the bigger that mountain of paperwork becomes. So is paperwork something that's um, like uh, personal to each stage manager or is there kind of a general template for paperwork? How does How does that work? Most stage managers have their own sort of style of paperwork, um, but they all follow kind of a general template. And some of those templates are laid out just by knowledge of being in the business. Some of those templates are laid out because a company has a particular paperwork suite or template that you follow for them. This is what our daily looks like. This is what our rehearsal schedules look like. This is what the calendar looks like. We are accustomed to this this is how we work. And so then you incorporate it into that. There are smaller companies that don't have a paperwork suite necessarily. So your show with them, you might be the paperwork suite. And so then it's like, you know, whatever your style is. Some people have tons of graphics and tons of color on their paperwork. Some people have really huge giant formats in the beginning. And then each of those formats gets pulled down and then there's a smaller paperwork that comes out of that. Or they'll say, Oh, I've chosen aerial condensed narrow 0.11 as my font for the show. And then everything you make has either a bold of that or an italic of that, or the regular of that as your font that you've chosen for the show. Hmm. And so it kind of just makes like one uniform grouping of stuff that you can use for that show. And then if there's a company that has a grouping of things, then they'll be like, these are the fonts we use. This is what our logo always looks like. You can use it in full color in grayscale and black and white, you know, and if it's a company that creates their own logos and their own images for the shows, then you pull that information onto the paperwork. So everything has sort of a uniform footprint and look. So that it's very 
okay, this is this company and this is this stage manager and this is what these things look like. Nice. Uh, What are characteristics of a great stage management team? My favorite characteristic of a great stage management team is being like symbiotic together, knowing that I'm thinking, I really wish we could have A, B, and C done for the end of the week. And that the team is like, yeah, and I'm going to work on A and I already have B started and we're heading in the direction of C and you don't have to spend a lot of time sort of talking and finessing that out. You already have this like shared language and shared brain of how to accomplish all that together. And, uh, you know, you only kind of, you sometimes magically fall into that. Like you can show up at a gig and not know anyone. And then you all have similar styles and you have similar, uh, experience level, or, you know, you have similar joy for different aspects of the job. Like maybe somebody loves paperwork and somebody really loves taking the blocking in the rehearsal room and checking everyone in and who's here and who's late and calling people. And so everybody has like their little specific thing that they really like to do and that they, or that they want to improve upon. And then if everyone's pieces of the puzzle all fit together perfectly, then you have this nice little like gelled together team. Mm -hmm. When you're the stage manager, so when you're kind of in the leadership position of the stage management team, how do you um, as the leader help um, guide um, ASMs into the, the team that you want? I mean, I always start by having sort of like an expectation and an experience conversation at our first day together. And it's usually like casually over coffee or over lunch or kind of like, let's start our day with what kind of experience we have and what we're looking to get out of this project and who's worked with this company before and who's done this show before. So that way we can all kind of know a little more about each other and what our knowledge base is that we're bringing to this particular experience that we're doing together. And then if there's something somebody wants to learn, I always want to let them be able to do that because if you're excited about learning it and you want to take that task on, you're probably going to achieve higher at it than it being assigned to you. And secretly, you really hate being assigned the costume plot and you have to follow (laughs) that through. And that's the thing that you don't like doing, but you don't know that because you didn't talk about it. So I always like to kind of, as a team, decide what we're going to focus on within reason. I mean, you know, you can't have like the second PA take down all the blocking uh, if they're really on to make sure that like we're doing prop handoffs and paging people and, you know, we have music rehearsals going down the hall. So they're the one that's going to run back and forth and get people over to here and over to there and walking someone to an interview. I mean, everyone has to kind of function within the role they have. But if there's an opportunity to learn something new that you want to learn, or if there's an opportunity to expand on your current knowledge base, I think that's what really helps you invest on being a good member of the team. Yeah, I like that. Uh, Do you have a favorite part of the process of putting up a show? Uh, Tech week is honestly like that moving into the theater the first day and then doing tech and dress is my favorite part because I feel like that's when the stage management team gets to shine because during Mm. rehearsal, everyone thinks the director is doing you know, the work and they're doing the show and they're staging it. And stage management is basically like sometimes in people's minds, just being like glorified receptionists and you're checking people (laughs) in and you're taking the notes and you're telling some people, some other information on notes and sending it out at the end of the night and you're taking the blocking. But like tech and dress is when all of our work that we've done and our skill set comes to the forefront, organizing people, getting them safely on and off stage taking all of the ideas that we've heard about for two to three to four weeks, depending on how long the process is and really helping them get out there and having all of that troubleshooting in your back pocket of, well, if this doesn't work or remember how we thought maybe they're never going to make that timing. So let's already preemptively move their prop closer and do this. And so those are like, those are our big moments. So that's, it's definitely my favorite. Plus I just love that, like, like the crazy energy you get from leaving the rehearsal room and moving to stage. I mean, it's like total palpable, like excitement. I just love Mm. it. 
I like that you say tech week because that's hardly anyone's answer. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm glad that there are people out there that enjoy (laughs) tech week rehearsals. Yeah. I mean, if I, if I were one of those people that was like, you know, making a glittery countdown on my call board to something, I would probably be counting down to tech week. (laughs) I love that image. (laughs) Um, Anything else uh, that you had wanted to talk about or or have been thinking about lately that you'd like to talk about? Not in particular. I mean, I I just think it's great that uh, there are, that there's more interest out there in the world now in sort of what I call the dark arts of theater, which is, you know, (laughs) all of us floating around in all black doing the magic. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I just, I think it's amazing because for so long, it was sort of like this, no, they're not a part of the art form and, oh, they're just stage hands or it's just a person there doing a job. But I mean, we are creating definite like artistic footprints on the show. I mean, think of a show that, that has like tons of lighting cues and, you know, tons of scenic changes and this and that. And if one thing in that puzzle runs a little late or goes a little awry, you have to be the person who's willing to say, wait on that cue, hold. I know we're already supposed to be going, but let's wait because if we wait two extra beats of music, even though it's not where it belongs, it'll look seamless. It'll look beautiful. It'll be this audience's experience and they won't know that it's not correct because it'll still look and feel the direction the design team wants it to do. And so for me, like, I just think it's very exciting that like, we finally have gotten to the day and age where people go, yeah, these other people that are like making the magic end quote, you know, are, are part of the process. So Mm -hmm. I'm just very excited about it. Yeah. I think there's, there's so much wisdom and knowledge uh, from people who work behind the scenes. I, I, um, not that people who work behind the scenes are necessarily like wanting more attention. You know, if you're pursuing a, that sort of career, you know, you, you, you're usually okay with being in the background, but sometimes it like kind of ch- like chaps me off that <laughs> like during the Tony awards, who's, who gets their award during the commercials? Like right. it's oh, absolutely. the designer, like that. Uh, come on. <laughs> yeah. The fact that you don't see any of it and it's like a recap and yeah, it's crazy, you know? So this is my attempt at fighting back at that because it bugs me. <laughs> I, 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 I think it's amazing. And, you know, I also think it's one of those like, you know, uh, for me, the thing that makes me the most uncomfortable ever as a stage manager is when like someone says, oh, and then you gesture stage management during the bows or, oh, uh, we like for stage management to come out and take a bow or wouldn't it be great if something and I'm the first one to be like, no, 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 we don't need that. We don't want that. It's OK. Like I, I don't seek that out that attention out. And it like instantly makes me uncomfortable because I feel like if we wanted to be on stage and in the spotlight and doing that version of being a part of the process, we would have went a different direction with our career. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that the part that we're bringing to the table is any less artistic. It doesn't mean that it should be any less appreciated by the audience, by producers, by award shows. I mean, who makes the award show visible for TV and <laughs> um, gets those people on and off stage and takes the award out of their hand and sends them on their way. Mm-hmm. That's, I mean, those, those are the people. So I love now that at the end of those shows, they're showing who the stage management teams are. I love that, you know, there are companies that are doing tech spotlights on social media and talking about like, you know, who their stage manager is or who their lighting designer is for a show. Like it's, I love that everyone is realizing like, we're all a part of this bar- big artistic process that is the show and the enjoyment of the art form. And so I just really love that. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. And I hope to see more of that um, from theaters, especially, you know, in the, in the future. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, I, it's definitely one of those things that I think is going to just keep changing and getting better. Um, but it's also like, it's a little bit, it's a little bit of like a double edged sword because then I think people are gonna, uh, you know, like, Oh, well, why do they get all these accolades now? And you're like, 
we've all been doing the same job, like the whole time. Like we're not, mm-hmm. no one's asking for extra anything. No one's asking for recognition that's undeserving. You know, it would be like all of a sudden at the end of a really great show, if bows were not taken, that's as much for the audience as it is for the cast. It's like, everyone's like, thank you together. Thank you for watching this process with us and helping us perform it for the night. Cause your energy makes it the show that it is today. And then the audience is saying, thank you to them for putting out this great piece of art that they got to see. I mean, we're all in it together. Mm-hmm, definitely. Uh, so final question, uh, advice to young people who are either, you know, in college for stage management or just starting out in their careers. I mean, I will give them the same advice that was given to me. Work as much as you can across the board in small and big and weird places in all of the art forms because every piece of experience you get will help inform the future version of your career. Yeah, especially as a stage manager, like you have to know, uh, you know, the language and like the basics of, of everything in theater. Yeah, I mean, so for me, it was like the fact that I never, I never was like, oh, I'm just going to work in one area. I'm going to just do dance. I'm going to just do opera. Like I've done dance, opera, special events. Um, You know, I've worked at like one-off things. I've done tours. If there was a job and I could say yes to it, I was saying yes, because in my mind, I was always like more experience is better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great advice. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michelle. Yeah, thank you. The music for the Backstage Creative was improvised and performed by Ian Leroy, and the logo was designed by Zach Rimbold.